Good morning. Let us worship God by singing the hymn of praise number 473. 473. beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the wonder of each hour, of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of ear and eye, for the heart and mind's delight, for the mystic harmony, linking sense to sound and sight. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For thy church that evermore lifteth holy hands above, offering up on every shore her pure sacrifice of love. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Let us confess our sin before Almighty God. Good and gracious God, hear us as in Christ we pray for forgiveness. While you reach out to us in fellowship, we turn away from you. We do not do what you command. We proclaim not your love, since we seldom serve others. We confess Christ as Savior, yet are indifferent to his teachings. Our discipleship suffers for we heed not your call. We are in need of repentance as we confess our sin. Have mercy upon us and grant us your pardon. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end <clears throat> Amen Amen <clears throat> Are there any announcements or joys or concerns in the bulletin or in the church? There are in the bulletin. <laughs> I would like to just say that uh, on behalf of the search committee, I don't know if all of you have heard or not, but we've had a very difficult time. We've not had very many applications, and we've been told we're not going to have very many applications because if people want to eat, they want full time work. And we can't pay full time. So this week, we are going.
Thank you, Martha Lynn. Welcome home. <laughs> Are there any other concerns? If not, let us pray. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> oh God, our Father, we come this morning in the beauty of the day, in the loveliness of your earth. We give you our thanks and our praise for all that you have been and done for us in all the days that we have lived. We pray, Father, that as a church we might be see ourselves as a family. We pray, God, that you will lead us in the search for a pastor. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us as we work with one another to carry on the work and the business of this church. Oh, Lord God, we pray for our nation and for the world. We pray, Lord, that we might be guided by your spirit. Help us not to be turned by the whims of economics or by the fear of the unknown. And grant, Lord, that we might do that which you would have us do. Help us to be seen as a nation of peacemakers. Grant, Father, that we might turn from the easy answers and search out the answers you have for us, which may be very difficult. O oh Lord, send your spirit upon us and be with us as we seek to carry out your will. Be with us, Lord, as we work in the church and outside of it. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with us when we go to those who are ill, those who mourn, those who are upset and confused. Help us to be with them and bring a sense of new health, new life, new understanding, and peace. Be with us, Lord, as we seek to be part of the great cloud of witnesses to your Son, that we, through your Spirit we might be known as your sons and daughters. Be with us, Lord, and hear us as we pray as you have taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is number 403. <laughs> i 
Let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear the word of God as we find it in Exodus chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Piraroth, be, between Megdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp over against it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, Israel of the people of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done? And we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 picked chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel as they went forth defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pirharoth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were in great fear. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is it because we, there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Let us alone, and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be still. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go on dry land through the sea. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they shall go after them. And I will get a glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, then the angel of God, who went before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and the night passed, without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and of the cloud looked down upon the host of the Egyptians and discomfited the host of the Egyptians, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. 
So Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned its wonted flow when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled into it, and the Lord routed the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not so much as one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw the great work which the Lord did against the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And from Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put them in the midst of them. And they said, and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened round his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the man by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always behold the faith of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine in the mountains and go and search for the one who went astray? And he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety and nine who never went astray. So it is with the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And there large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it as lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let non, not man put asunder. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, For your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is not expedient to marry. But he said to them, Not all men can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Then the children were brought to him, that he may lay his hands upon them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And behold, one came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? One there is who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. And the man said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have observed. 
what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, When with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man shall sit on his glorious throne, you, have, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and eter inherit eternal life. But many that are first will be last, and the last first. Here ends the reading. These are rather long scripture readings today, but with the way things are going, and as I was doing the study for it, I didn't know where to cut them off. So you get to listen to a lot. I think we really need to listen to both of these scriptures quite closely today. Uh, they're talking to us, the people of God. We may not be caught in the Red Sea, but we may soon be caught in the Red Sea if we don't watch out. I, I love the story of Pharaoh and, and uh, the, the phrase that he uses over, the writer uses over again and again, his host and his horses and his chariots. because. 2,000 years ago, when this was going on, 3,000 years ago, a horse and a chariot were like owning your own 747. Very few people had horses, and very few people had chariots. And those that had them could just run everybody down. How many, well, all of us remember seeing horses and buggies on the road. I heard the other day that an Amish family were hurt very badly when a man came over the top of a hill and hit their chariot as they were going down the road. There was a day when that horse and buggy was about as good as you can get. My dad tells the story of when they had a wonderful crop in 1917. Everything was wonderful. There was a war going on. The prices were great. And his dad went out and bought a beautiful surrey with fringe on top and isinglass curtains that rolled down in the rain, and they were on Easy Street. And they loved to drive to town. They had two white horses, and they loved to drive to town real fast and pass up all those people in their buckboards and their wagons with the old Percherons pulling them. In 1918, my grandfather died and left my grandmother with 40,000 horses. She had two things that were out of date that year, horses and button shoes. She went broke on both. Chariots get stuck in the mud. And I think that little phrase where it says, their wheels mired down. How many of you have ever been stuck? Well, good. I'm glad to see there are some people who tell the truth, you know. Uh, right. I, I remember getting stuck one time when I was in university, and my cousin and his best friend and I went over to a town called Humphrey, Nebraska. Humphrey's a town of about 900 people, 9,000 of whom are Roman Catholic. And so during Lent, there is no dancing. But on Easter Sunday, Humphrey has the best dance. You can still go to Humphrey, and they have the best dance in the country. The night we were there, they had two great bands. They had Lawrence Welk, and they had Wayne King. And boy, we went and we danced until 2 in the morning. And we were really great because we were in a brand new Pontiac with these new kind of tires. You know, the tubeless ones? 
And as we were coming back through Lindsay, which is a town about like Honorville, we got stuck in the gumbo right in Main Street. I mean, we were stuck. And in trying to get out, we pulled the tires off the wheels. <laughs> and then all the people of Lindsay came out and looked at our beautiful car and our wonderful tires, and they laughed. Just as the writer in here in Exodus is laughing at the Egyptians with all their newfangled equipment getting stuck in the sea. And we're told the cloud stayed between them and the host of Egyptians. And they knew it was finally all over when the sea went back and they saw the bodies of all the Egyptians lying on the beach. That's pretty graphic. We can see that in our mind's eye. And the Lord was on their side. And you know, that's a problem. People keep telling us the Lord is on our side. Almost anything we do, the Lord is on the side of. How you all, I'm sure, knew somebody from the Confederacy or somebody from the Union Army. Now, whose side were they on? And listen to the psalm. Whose side is God on? Now, I think we have to get our, when we talk about, what is it? I guess we're south of Mason Dickens point. The war between the states. Uh, when we talk about the war between the states, I think we have to get down to brass tacks and realize that God probably didn't have a heck of a lot to do with any of that. Because after all, it was a fight over economics. We've talked about slaves. We talked about slaves a couple of weeks ago. You know, slaves were capital. And the South stood to lose two-thirds of his capital in one swell foop if the slaves were freed. But the Union really wasn't interested in freeing the slaves. The Union was really interested in maintaining the railroads and maintaining the industrial revolution that was starting and maintaining the great economics that were beginning to happen. And the middle class was growing. And we've all grown up in that middle class. Slavery was a side issue. We're now paying the price of our answer to that because you see, Mr. Lincoln and most of the people in power wanted all the slaves to be shipped back to Angola or Liberia. And that's why, what's the capital city of Liberia? You hear it every day, folks. What is the capital city of Liberia? School starts tomorrow. You better get back. <laughs> Liberia is Monroeville, named after President Monroe, because Mr. Lincoln has extended the Monroe Doctrine to include Liberia. So that we could send all the slaves back. You listen to those black people from Liberia talk on the radio. They do not speak with British accents. They talk American. They are ex-Americans. That was the answer of the Civil War. It was economics we were talking about. Um, First World War? Well, of course, Spanish-American War, Mr. Hearst started. He needed to sell newspapers. And the proof is probably pretty well in now that he was the one that bombed the main so it sank in the harbor of huh, Havana. And we had a war, and that way we took Cuba, we took Panama, and we took the Philippine Islands. And they were ours. And Mr. Reagan let us know. We took Panama, and we shouldn't let it go. It's ours. It was economics. The First World War, well, my goodness. It wasn't over the thinking of the Lusitania. It was over the fact that if Germany and the Central Powers were able to compete on equal terms economically, Britain and America were going to have to slow down. That was the end of that. So we had the First World War. <clears throat> the second one, all of us pretty much remember that, had nothing much to do with Pearl Harbor, which of course we knew was going to happen several days before it happened. My dad, whom you have met, was a spy in China in 1927 to 31, spying on the Japanese. 
He was in the Philippine Islands spying out the airfields that were being built by the Japanese in 1930, 1931. We were in the middle of a depression and there was no way out. And it was economics. The war pulled us out. The depression didn't end, end until we started building ships and planes and bullets. <clears throat> Two million boys are an easy price to pay for comfort. Korea, well, we fought that one over economics, because if the Chinese could take that, the next step would be Japan. Vietnam, we know now that the Tomkin Gulf thing was a fraud. There was never an attack. But you see, there's oil in Vietnam. There's stuff that grows in the jungles that we use as heart medicine. And it only grows there. And now we're in the oil business again. And ladies and gentlemen, I know I'm talking politics, but I don't know how you talk politics if you don't talk religion, at least in the American context. Mr. Hitler, uh, he's been brought up again now, poor man. And um, he changed the church in Germany so that it matched the Nazi state. People who didn't agree went to concentration camps. There were several hundred thousand Christians who were killed because they disagreed with the line of the government in Germany. They died in Buchenwald. They died in those terrible places. It wasn't all Jews. Well, here we are. We're on the brink of it again. Uh, I really wish that if you, you know, as a religious duty, as an exercise, that you would turn on national public radio. It's about as close as we come to a free press in the United States. And the national public radio can be heard on 91.3 FM or 90 FM. One's from Columbia, one's from Warrensburg. They're trying to give both sides of this thing that's going on right now. And I think we need to listen to it. And one of, the, one of the things that the rest of the world is hearing that we don't hear is that what this is solving for us is the SNL crisis. You see, it's gotten so big that it's costing more than the Second World War. And they announced Friday that the FDIC, which is behind the banks, is in just as bad shape. We can't have people worrying about that. A war will get us out of it. That's all there is to it. Can we afford it? Are we really? Is God's cloud really in front of us and behind us? I don't know. I really don't know. I wouldn't want to be in the president's shoes. But at the same time, as an American, I am in his shoes, and you are in his shoes. And we must think about this from the point of view of what must we do to inherit eternal life? And I love the story of the rich young ruler, and I love it especially in the King James, which I didn't read today. But in the King James, when Jesus has told the young man, well, you must keep the commandments. And he says, and he lists them. And, and the man says, I've done that all our lives. And every one of us, I think, can say, we've done these all our lives. We have been good, loving, mostly kind, helpful, determined, faithful people. And the man said, I've done all that. What else do I need to do? I've done it all. And Jesus said, well... Go and sell everything you have and follow me. And the King James says, and the young man went away sorrowful because he had much goods. Uh, if we solve our oil problem, and there are several solutions that are at hand and are invented that we're not following. First one is we can quit using so much oil and buy our oil from Americans, from the people in Venezuela, from the people in Mexico, from the people in Canada. There's plenty of oil. We just don't buy it from them because it'll cost us $2 more. It's better than 500 billion. 
Or we can go to the electrical business. <laughs> How many of you ever drove an electric car? I did. <laughs> One time when I was in the seventh grade, my girlfriend Yes, that's one of the reasons you have girlfriends in seventh grade. Is they have grandmothers that own electric cars and, uh, and high-wheel bicycles. You know. We'd go riding those bikes, but the most fun, we were only, you know, 11. But she had a big driveway that didn't go onto the street. And we'd get in the electric car, and we'd just hum ourselves around. Go, mm. We'd drive around. It's all glass. It's beautiful. We had two servants that kept it polished. All we had to do was make it dirty. And it had rose bowls in the windows, you know. Lovely. That car was built in 1904. When I was working in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the people on my Board of Christian Education was the Vice President of Westinghouse. And he was talking about an interesting experiment they were doing there because the problem with the American Army is that it's dependent upon diesel. We, we make our electricity from diesel. And those darn generators don't work half the time. And if they do work, the diesel's frozen in the lines or it's the wrong grade or something. And so you're out of electricity a good share of the time. And in Vietnam, they were in a terrible plight because they were having trouble with their electricity. And so they asked Westinghouse if they couldn't invent some sort of a solar thing that would provide the electricity. And they did. Man showed it to me. It's a little chip about that big, solar. And it does two things. It catches electricity and it stores electricity. Cost about that big. Each one produces one kilowatt. To produce a thousand, you hook a thousand of them together, which forms a thing about this big, and it produces a thousand. And it costs about 25 cents a piece if they're mass produced. They were patented, the patent was bought, and they've never been produced. Think if you no longer had to pay an electric bill, period. Would that help? Would we need all that oil? If you had a car that didn't make any smoke and went forever, uh, you know, there's no moving parts in an electric engine. Wouldn't you like to do that? But you see, it would mean changing the way we are. It would make some problems because ladies, we'd have to start pressing again. You know, all of our clothes are made out of petroleum. And, uh, when my students tell me they want to go back to the 50s, I say, ah, how many of you know how to iron? Because if you don't know how to iron, you don't want to go back to the 50s. But I have a feeling that maybe we could electrify the clothes or something, you know, and they'd iron themselves. I don't know, but uh, we have not begun to even look at the situation. And we're sitting here and we laugh. At, but why do we laugh? Because this is very painful. What is happening to us is very painful. And what we're doing to the Arabs and the Arab countries is going to get us into more trouble than we can ever ask for in our lives. First of all, they don't want us. That's been going on since 765 AD. The Muslims have their countryside and they like it the way it is. But we treat them like we treated the Sioux Indians. The only problem is the Sioux didn't have oil wells. And you see, the problem with oil in, in 1860 was who needed it? It, it was uh, useless. No, they don't want us. They haven't wanted us since the Crusades, and we lost all three of those. I don't know what makes us think now that we can take on half the world. That's a billion and a half people. I don't know why we want to. And I don't think it's the Lord's will that we would do this. But we've got to think about it. And you see, thinking about it is unpopular. And what's even more unpopular is talking about it. What's more important is really looking and saying, can we honestly say that this is God's plan for his world? That we should destroy one another with gas and atomic weapons? 
Because I can tell you this, in 1956, when I was in Korea, the war was over, but we were planning the new fire plans for these new projectiles we had that we could put in Honest John rockets and that we could put in 105 howitzers and 8-inch guns. And an 8-inch gun can shoot a shell 22 miles and land within 6 inches of where you want it to land. And those were all equipped, at that time, we were equipping them with atomic warheads. The two decisions we had to make when we were making those fire plans were this. One, how many of our own troops are we willing to kill in order to get the advantage? Because you can't shoot them without killing your own people. And two, why would we do it? And the only reason that was really given, two reasons were given. One was if they shot atomic weapons at us. And it was quite obvious the Chinese at that time, nor the North Koreans, or the Russians even, were going to do that. The next reason was, if they use poison gas or a biological warfare, then we must use it. Folks, all the gas masks and all the gas suits in the world are not going to protect our troops when the atomic bombs go. They will melt the desert to glass, and the oil will be gone forever. Now, is that what we want, and is that what God wants? I doubt it. So this week, I'm going to give you a very unpopular assignment. One, you may not listen to any other radio stations besides 91.3 and 90.0 on your little radios. Now, I'll give you a respite. You don't have to listen after 9 o'clock in the morning, but at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you have to turn it back on. You have to listen to those news reports because they're coming from everywhere, and they're coming from all sorts of people. They're coming from Americans who are saying something else. They're coming. All I want you to know is balance it. Listen to what the rest of the world is saying. What do they really believe about us? What are we really doing? What are our motives? Because Jesus is asking...